Fine, good, okay, happy, sad, fine and dandy. Fine and dandy. Why are we all of those things? For what? Shabbat. Shabbat. Great reason to be gathered here together today. It is Shabbat. Thank God we made it to another one, another week. And uh, welcome. If you're new here, new tuning in online, this is Mishkan David. Don't freak out. Just a little bit of Hebrew. It means tabernacle of David. Why? So very important because we do our very best to emulate here what it says in Amos chapter 9 and verse 11. Why? Because we are Jew and Gentile alike come in agreement that Jesus the Christ, whom the world says He is, we come in agreement that the name above every name, His true name is Yeshua. And He is the Messiah of Israel, the Son of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it says here, speaking about the last days, which we know very well that we are in these last days, that it says, In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen, and close up the breaches thereof. There is a 2,000-year-old breach between Jew and Gentile. And if you are wondering what that is about or what happened, we encourage you to do your homework. Go back in the archives. Rabbi Gabe has talked extensively about Acts chapter 15 and Acts 21. Do your homework. Talk, find out what breach we're talking about here. What happened between Jew and Gentile. And so by the grace of God, he is closing up that breach here and he is raising up the ruins and he is building it as in the days of old. So yes, we are being restored to our former glories, to new heights that we can, you know, strive for and new things that we've never seen before because we were doing it like they first did it when he first came. And that was the true gospel, that we would all come in agreement together. And so that's why it is very powerful and amazing to be here. Behind me is the elements, the candles, the bread, the wine, uh, I don't know where the candles were. Was I supposed to put the candles in? It doesn't matter. We'll get some candles. And see what happens when Reuben doesn't show up? But that's okay. Very important. And uh, behind me, seven good reasons as to why you should care about the Shabbat. If you come from a Jewish background, you'll be very familiar and comfortable with this day. And if you come from a Christian background, you may not be so comfortable with this day. But that's the beauty about it is that we have the right day. And as Jews, unfortunately, with the right day, we were practicing it in the wrong way. We were worshiping the right God in the wrong way, and Shabbat was a burden. I know this because I was raised in that, and there was no spirit whatsoever. Thank you, Robinson. And if you come from a Christian background, you had the Holy Spirit, but it is very scripturally well documented that you were worshiping on the wrong day. So here, by the grace of God, we have the Holy Spirit and on the right day, which is why it's so amazing. Because not only did the Lord bless the Shabbat before the commandments were given to the children of Israel, in Leviticus it says that today is a holy Sabbath day of rest and a convocation, a holy convocation. I encourage you to go in Leviticus, do your own homework. Don't believe a word I'm saying. Read the word for yourself to see if what we're saying here is true. And a holy convocation, if you look up in the Webster's Dictionary, the definition of a convocation is, that is a synonym for the word gathering. So not only is it a holy day, but this is a holy gathering. And so we're getting double, triple, quadruple, quintuple the amount of Holy Spirit on this day. And so we come in agreement, especially because Jesus, Messiah, Yeshua, He gathered on this day. There are over nine accounts in the New Covenant that state that it says, as His custom was, He went to the synagogue on the Shabbat. So He went and He gathered on the Shabbat. And because we want to be just like Messiah, Yeshua, that is our goal here. We want to copy Him. And so because He did it, that is yet another reason why, as to it's so important as to why we do it. And so... You know, congratulations for coming. You should all be happy that you're coming because many people are not even coming out of their houses. So thank God you decided to come in and make it and celebrate this first blessed feast for the Lord. And so behind me, like I said, are the elements here. And it's a very 
a distinct setup that the Lord has done. Even the way that the things are formulated, you know, there's that old adage that a picture is worth a thousand words. And so every single setup here, when you put your eyes on the Lord, you can truly see what's important. And I want to first talk about this table. If you would please stand. The first blessing we're going to do is the blessing over the candles. Now, it is not a commandment to light the candles on the Shabbat, but we continue lighting the candles the candles on the Shabbat for several different reasons. Number one, if you look in your word, there are over 40 references to candles in the Bible. And so automatically we know that the Lord loves candles because it's a representation of light. But very specifically in Exodus chapter 40, starting in verse 1, it talks about something very important. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, On the first day of the first month shall you set up the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation. And in verse 3, it says, And you shall put therein the ark of the testimony and cover the ark with the veil. We do not have a veil here for a very specific reason. And then number 4, it says, And you shall bring in the table and set in order the things that are to be set in order upon it. And you shall bring in the candlestick and light the lamps thereof. And so this is not only a representation of uh, a Jewish tradition that has been going for several thousands of years. This happened before even tradition was created. This is here in the word, a representation of the temple, the holy of holies, everything that we see here for a very important reason. Now, why? Because we want to know about who Messiah Yeshua is, where he came from, what he was about, how he did things. And so, like they say, you can only know where you're going if you know where you come from. And so Messiah Yeshua, the reason why we light the candles, because a woman was elected to light the candles. And that is a depiction of what happened in Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. One of the first prophecies about Messiah Yeshua in Isaiah. And it says here, therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. As we know that he confirms his word with signs and wonders. And it says, behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Im Anuel, which is Hebrew. Direct translation is with us, God. But we all now say Emmanuel, God is with us. And so very important because a little uh, young Jewish woman, her name was Miriam, not Mary. She was conceived of the Holy Spirit as a virgin, so much so that Yosef, being a righteous Jewish man, was going to hide her away from everyone so that she didn't get stoned. Because if you were to do the do before you were married. You were a harlot and you were stoned to death. And so um, by the grace of God, an angel visited Joseph and he said, Joseph, and he said, that is my baby growing inside of her belly. And so we know that Messiah Yeshua came through a woman. So my gorgeous bride is going to come up here, light the candles for us, participate in the blessing, thanking him, not only for giving us the light of the world, but showing that a light of the world did indeed Come through a woman. In fact, we are commanded to be light and salt. O Kata Adonai, Eloheinu Melekaulam, Esheki Shenu with Barov and Atalanu at Yeshua Meshikenu. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe. You have sanctified us by your word, given us Yeshua, our Messiah, and commanded us to be a light to the world. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Now, the next prayer on the screen is the blessing over the bread. If you haven't got a chance, there are elements in the back there. There's uh, matzah, wine, and juice. And I can take the wrapper off. I probably, I probably should have done that beforehand. I'm really spoiled, man. Reuben, if you're watching online, you better get your tuchus back here very soon. No, it's okay. There we go. Now you can see it more beautifully and more clearly there. An artisan style challah tonight. Very different, but very special and delicious looking. But we are pursuing the spirit. So let's forget how delicious this looks right now. 
and talk about the reason why we show the challah. It is a story given to us by our dear Rabbi and Rebetzin that uh, many years ago, as the Rebetzin was crafting uh, one of these in the kitchen, uh, the, Lord, the Lord showed Gabe as he was looking on, and he said that that is a representation of who I am. Now, how could you say that, T-squared? Well, the traditional uh, challah recipe is three pieces of dough being braided into one loaf. And the reason why that's important because of a Hebrew word called echad. Now, the direct translation for echad into English is one, but specifically, if you look at the dictionaries in Hebrew, it means single entity made up of more than one part. And the base pronoun for that is yachid. But then later on, if you go into the word Elohim, who's heard that before? So Elohim in Hebrew is a plural word. So you are declaring God to be a single entity made up of more than one part. And why do we know it is three and one? It is not the Trinity. That is a uh, man-made, created idea. They were trying to completely separate God, Father, and Son. But we reference 1 John um, chapter 3 and verse 7. Very, very important what it says there. And it says very specifically, I'm sorry, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7. And it uh, it says there very specifically what's going on in heaven, how we know that there are three in one. And it says, for there are three that bear record in heaven. Bear record in KJV terms is the ones who who are in charge of what things is going on. They give mandates, they give edicts. Bearing record means that you are the one in charge doing things in heaven. And it says, the Father, the Word, which if you know a little bit of your Bible, Messiah Yeshua is described as the Word of God billion times in the word, and it says, and the Holy Ghost, the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, and these three are Echad, one. And so when we declare God to be Echad, we are removing human thinking. We are removing the fact that we put Him in a box. And here at Mishkan David, we do not put the Lord in a box. He expresses Himself exactly how He wants to, when He wants to, to whom He wants to. And so we liberally declare that our Father and and the Son and the Holy Spirit, they are Echad, they are one. And if you have a pizza masa, I encourage you to look up into the light. There's tiny little holes in it. And if you have a big enough piece, there's uh, large brown stripes going down. And the reason why this is important, because on the night of Pesach, yes, Passover, the first night after Passover starts the Feast of Unleavened Bread which if you come here for a year cycle, you will participate in that with us. We encourage you, hopefully, you're able to stick around until then. But the word Pesach, why it's so very important, is because the children of Israel in Egypt, when they were on their way out, they were commanded to wipe the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of their house, but then they were commanded to consume the entire lamb. And you were not allowed to leave a piece of it Till the morning. If you got full and you couldn't eat anything else, you were supposed to burn it as a sacrifice. Now, why is that so important? We fast forward and we know that Messiah is described as the Lamb of God. He broke a piece of bread and he said, here, this is my body. Eat, partake. The same thing that happened to the children in in Egypt before they were liberated out of Egypt. He told them to eat. He told them to consume the lamb. And why is this so very important? Because he took that punishment for us. We know later that night he was arrested, beaten. He was whipped 40 times with a Roman lash, which is a fulfillment of prophecy that says another prophecy in Isaiah, by his stripes we are healed. And then later on, uh, he's they partitioned his garments and started gambling, which is another prophecy fulfilled in Isaiah. I encourage you to read Isaiah if you want to learn about some prophecies about the Messiah. And then after that, he had to carry his own cross until as a human being, he ran out of energy and they had to get someone to carry it the rest of the way for him. And finally, he was crucified on that cross. And so we are partaking in his punishment, in his death, so that we don't have to. We are consuming the entire Lamb of God so that we don't punish ourselves and we don't punish other people. And so every single week we thank Him for the ability to eat and partake in what He has done for us, granting us not only eternal life, but freeing us 
from a life of punishment. And so please join me as we communally thank him for his body being broken on our behalves. Bauch et Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam chamotzi lechem min haaretz. Amen. In English, blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who wishes forth bread from the earth. Amen. And let us never forget that Yeshua, our Messiah, is the true bread from heaven that a man may eat thereof and never taste death. Please partake in his body. The next prayer on the screen is going to be the blessing over the yine or the wine. Again, so very important. And if you come from a church background, you know that this is communion. Yes, it is communion, but it is not a uh, New Testament concept. This is something that has been going on since Belishit, the beginning, in Genesis. If you look in Genesis, we know that Adam and Eve fell from grace. They were deceived, and he blamed her, and she blamed the devil. But either way, they made their own choices. And so immediately, the Lord was addressing in the beginning that we are all responsible for ourselves. We cannot point the finger at anybody else, especially, unfortunately, there are many brothers and sisters today that like to say, the devil made me do it. Not a valid response. We decide to do those things. And so when they decided to sin, which sin is the breaking of the Lord's commandments that can be found in 1 John chapter 3 as well, because the first commandment given from God to man was do not eat from that tree. And so when they sinned and they broke that commandment, he had to exact judgment. Now, a lot of people like to say the God of the old covenant was not a forgiving God. Unfortunately, you just haven't read it enough. He was very merciful. Yes, their sin had a price, but they didn't die. They had to exact judgment and take responsibility. The man had to sweat from his brow, and the woman had to receive, uh, you know, pains from birth for the rest of their lives. But he did something very important because they hid themselves from God when they sinned, realizing that they were ashamed. And so the Lord from the beginning was showing us how merciful he is by going out into that garden and calling them by name because he wants each and every single one of us to stay in his presence. That is what it's always been about. And so if you reference in Genesis, we know that it says an animal slain on their behalf and they were made coats of skins and that Hebrew word skins can be found all over the Bible, but more specifically in Leviticus, excuse me, chapter 7 and verse 8, we know that that word skins was used by the Levitical priesthood, and it says, and the priest that offereth any man's burnt offering, even the priest shall have to himself the skin of the burnt offering which he hath offered. So yes, we know that it was an animal sacrifice, and we know that that animal was used to cover their shame. And so since we know that Messiah Yeshua is the Lamb of God, his blood was spilt on our behalf to pay for our sins and to cover our shame. One of the devil's greatest tools is a word called guilt. He will guilt you out of the presence of God and he will guilt you out of the kingdom of God. And so when you truly realize the power of the blood of Messiah Yeshua, the purpose, we weren't saved just to make it into heaven. We were saved so that we could stay in his presence now. And so we take advantage of that gift freely given to us, and we thank him every single week for the ability to boldly approach the throne of grace. So please join me. Ba'uch et Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam, borei pri hagafen. Amen. In English, blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. As King David said, come, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see, please. If he is good, say Amen. Now, the next prayer on the screen is for those of us who do not just want to live on a taste of God. Now, before we get to that, here in front of me, like I said, the elements, the candles, the bread, the wine, 
It is an image depiction, an exact representation of the gospel. This is Messiah Yeshua right here. And so when he was born into this world, when his body was broken for us and his blood was spilt on our behalf, it gave us access to the Holy of Holies. That is why there is no veil covering, because we go through him, through this table, into the presence of God, which is a privilege that only the high priest once per year was allowed to do. And oddly enough, the Lord showed me something really cool. We get a lot of criticism here, so get used to it if you want to keep coming. But very specifically, uh, we get criticism about either not being Christian enough or not being Jewish enough. But oddly enough, the Lord set it up perfectly for us in Exodus chapter 40, where it talks about the setting up of the table. If you go down to verse 24, it says something very specific, how we do things. And um, it says, and he put the candlestick in the tent of the congregation over against the table on the side of the tabernacle southward. And so we get a lot of complaints that we're not facing east towards Jerusalem. But in fact, the Lord set it up perfectly scripturally that the candles are on the south and the Holy of Holies is pointing in which direction? That's right. And so look how even the Lord gave us the scriptures coming alive in our building even. Wow. Praise God for that. And so we go onto the Shema, the ability to have access into the Holy of Holies. Why? Because of what Messiah Yeshua said in Matthew chapter 22, verses 35 through 40. And a lawyer, a studier of the word of God, asked him a question, tempting him, trying to mess him up, saying, Master or Rabbi, what is the greatest commandment in the law. And this is why we are powerful here when we come in agreement in what he said. Whether you're a Jew, you have to get saved to have access into the Holy of Holies. Whether you're a Gentile, you have to get saved to have access into the Holy of Holies. And then it continues with this because he quoted Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. And it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, echad, that special word. And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your might, was told to the children of Israel, because they are a physical representation of our spiritual walk. But Messiah Yeshua said, very important word, mind. And if you read about the entire Bible, you know how important the mind is. And specifically, Rav Shaul, Rabbi Paul, he said, you are transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so it is a fulfillment of the new covenant, which is in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34, which we are called to give him our heart and our inward parts, and he will write his law. And we shall be his people, and he will be our God. And so Messiah Yeshua was giving us the ability to fulfill the Torah through the new covenant, which is individual application of his laws for us. But you have to give him your heart. You have to bring him your inward parts, which is your soul and your mind, 100% and not 10% of your pocket. And so if you're interested in giving God 100% of doing what our Savior did, because we called upon his name, so we want to be like him. And so if you want to be restored, if you want to be healed, if you want to serve him, if you want to, excuse me, be in the spirit, then you have to do what he said. And he gave us the groundwork and he came to show us how to do it here. And so we would declare this here together every single week what Messiah Yeshua told us how and what to do. So please join me as we declare our marching orders. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Baruch Shem Kevot, Malchuto Leolam Vaed. In English, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be his name, whose glorious kingdom is forever and ever and ever. Please give him a round of applause. We thank you, Lord. Now, this next prayer here on the screen, again, very important, and everything is done in order. You first have to be saved to have a relationship with God, and then you pursue your relationship with God, and then the Kiddush prayer becomes relevant, because the Kiddush prayer is about the Shabbat, thanking Him for giving us His laws, His ordinances, for choosing us, 
because you are here, you are chosen, okay? And thanking him for the ability to have all of these things. Because like the Word of God says, that the Shabbat was made for man, man not for the Shabbat. This is our gift, our gift given 24-hour experience to learn how to unplug from this world, which is what Messiah Yeshua said, that we are in this world, but we are not of this world. And so you must learn how to not of this world for one day before you can take that with you for the rest of the week. And so after you've established your relationship with God, then He can tell you what to do. And if He put on your heart to celebrate the Shabbat, amen, me too. And so, please join me in the Kiddush prayer, which is perfectly spelled out in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. And uh, we don't have to read that right now, but please join me as we declare thanksgiving for this day for us. Ba'ucha ta'adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam, asher kiddishanu b'vizpotav ratzavanu, v'shabbat kodesho b'ahav ratzon hing hilanu, zikaron l'maseh v'reshit. Amen. Now in English. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and wanted us to be his own. And with love and favor, he gave us his holy Sabbath as a heritage, a remembrance of creation. For that day is the prologue to the holy convocation, a memorial of the exodus from Egypt. For us did you choose and us did you sanctify from all the nations. And your holy Sabbath with love and favor did you give us as a heritage. Blessed are you, O Lord, who sanctifies the Sabbath. Amen. Praise God. Now, this next prayer here on the, on the screen is the Rafur, the Shemone Ezre, the prayer for health and healing. And why do we end with that before we go into worship? Because it needs to set the tone of how we think and how we feel. We are given the gospel by Messiah Yeshua, access into the Holy of Holies through the Shema. Then you can start participating in the Shabbat. And I believe once you start participating in the Shabbat and plugging into the Spirit, then your healing will start. But it's predicated on one very important thing, having a clean heart. When I got here, I was a very angry person. I was a very bitter person. I was a very acidic person. I was a very crazy person. I had every single thing possibly that could go wrong with me. It, it's funny now, yes. But every single thing that could possibly go wrong with a young man went wrong. Most of it was because of my own choices, and then, of course, the devil takes those things and he runs with it. But at the end of the day, I came in with a lot of one word, unforgiveness. I hated my parents. I hated my family. I hated my friends. I hated acquaintances. I hated strangers. I hated everybody. And so I was a very unlikable person, and because of that, I was very sick. I was mentally incapacitated. They told me I would never be a regular member of society. I would never be able to interact normally, hold a job. And then on top of that, I had health issues. Okay, I'm a former drug addict and alcoholic. Now, by the grace of God, I don't desire those drugs. I only desire one now, which is the high of the most high. But um, <laughs> praise God, yes. But uh, one thing they told me is that even at 20 years old, if I were to continue my college experience, a full four years of drinking the way that I was drinking at the time, I would have ended up with the liver of a man who had been drinking for 30 years. And so that is the copious amounts of these different things that I was chasing ultimately to fill that void in my soul. But one thing I can tell you is that you have to forgive. Once I heard Rabbi Gabe talk about his experience and that the Lord showed him that it is about the heart and having a clean heart, and he said he prayed to the Lord, Lord, please make this process as quick and as painless as possible because it's never going to be painless and it's not always going to be quick. You know, the Lord is not a microwave. Most of the time, it's an oven, which is low and slow, okay? And so I was only healed instantaneously of one thing, but everything else was a process. That is why it's called a circumcision of the heart, because a scalpel is one of the sharpest instruments in the world, and it cuts very precisely. So sometimes that will hurt, but through the pain, 
when you give it to him and you decide to release, you realize that it is not worth being out of his presence for other people. And so we freely give those things up to him so that he can heal us, so that he can restore us, so that we can continuously be in his presence. And so if that's something that you're interested in, please join me as we say this prayer. Raphaeno Adonai vene Rafe, Hoshienu veni Vashiach. Heal us, O Lord, and we shall be healed. Save us, and we shall be saved. Katilatenu Atta, for you are our praise. Vehala Refuashlema lechol Mahotenu, and bring complete recovery for our ailments. Yehiratzon milfanecha Adonai Elohe velohe avote. May it be your will, O Lord my God, and the God of my forefathers. Shetishlach meherefuashlima min hashemain that you quickly send a complete recovery from heaven. Spiritual healing and physical healing. For you are God, King, the faithful and compassionate healer. Blessed are you, O Lord, who heals the sick of his people, Israel. Amen. Now, the Rebetzin is going to take us through the call to worship, which has many different reasons. You should learn to fall in love with that sound because, again, hopefully you are able to be here long enough to reach Yom Teruah so you can learn the true purpose of that sound and why is it so very important. But the way we enter into His courts is with thanksgiving and with praise. And if you feel like you have nothing to praise for, if you have nothing to be thankful for, you're alive. The fact that he opened each and every single one of our eyes this morning is reason enough. And so I encourage you to call upon the name of the Lord and really enjoy this experience. Bring yourself to him fully, humbly. Prostrate yourself at the foot of his throne and you will see him work wonders in your life. I love you all. God bless you. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom, everybody. And uh, as we get ready to enter into his courts with thanksgiving and with praise, of course, as T said, we're going to listen to a very important sound, the sound of the shofar, this call to worship, this call to peace. It's a reminder that this 24-hour period known as the Shabbat is a very special 24-hour period. It is not a holiday. It is a holy day, one of the very first ones that God himself instituted. It is a special day. Not only are we called to a holy convocation, in other words, a holy assembly, that, but it's also a day, 24-hour period, where we are to meditate on him, God himself, his greatness, his glory, all of these things. These things that, that are all of the things that are involved in the word worship. And we are, he pulls us out, he calls us on Shabbat and pulls us out of our earthly concerns. Things, concerns over things that are going to pass anyway. And we are required to focus on only one, one person, the eternal one, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Lord of the universe, our Father, but remember our King. And so as we focus and we hang on to him who has provided the means for us to abide in his presence through the Shema, the first and great commandment, we also understand that it is through abiding in his presence that the Shabbat is an opportunity to put that into practice and to receive not only the Holy Spirit, but understanding, love, wisdom, comfort, joy, peace, all of those things come from being connected with him. And I would call, uh, recommend that as you listen to this call to worship, this call to, to peace, that you would call upon the name of Yeshua, Messiah Yeshua, the promised one, because he said, without me, you can do nothing. And he is the Sar Shalom, the Prince of Peace. So there's no point in wishing anybody Shabbat Shalom if you don't have the Prince of Peace abiding in you. So I would suggest that you call upon his name as we listen to the shofar, the call to worship and the call to peace.
ויהי ערב ויהי בוקר, יום השישי. ויאכלו השמיים והארץ בכל צבאם, ויאכל אלוהים ביום השביעי מלאכתו אשר עשה, וישפוט ביום השביעי מכל מלאכתו אשר עשה, ויברך אלוהים את יום השביעי ויקדש אותו. כי הוא שבת מכל מלאכתו אשר ברא אלוהים לעשות. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Thus, the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it, he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. Blessed art thou, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who separates the holy from the profane. Blessed art thou, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has instituted a Shabbat of rest where we can rest in your presence and fellowship with you and fellowship with one another and meditate on your greatness, the glory and the wonder of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Lord of the universe. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, because you are the renewer of our days and the keeper of promises. You sent the Messiah, the Redeemer, to Israel to teach us how to walk in righteousness, to teach us exactly how to walk out the Torah so that we can enjoy the blessings of your favor, your continual favor. Blessed art thou, Lord, King, Lord our God, King of the universe, because Messiah Yeshua did indeed teach us how to walk in righteousness and he taught us that true righteousness begins in the heart. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, because you will send the Messiah again very soon, very, very soon, to take his rightful place on the throne of David in Jerusalem and at long last establish your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. And we will enjoy at long last what we've been pining for for centuries, peace on earth and goodwill to all men. As we enter into his courts with thanksgiving and with praise, I'm reminded of what King David said in the book of Chronicles. He said, then on that day, David delivered his first, his first psalm to thank the Lord into the hand of Asaph and his brethren. And he said, give thanks unto the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deed among the people, sing unto him, sing psalms unto him, talk ye of all his wondrous works. That's what Shabbat is all about. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his love endures forever and ever and ever. As we enter into his courts with thanksgiving and with praise. Thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his love endures forever. He is good, he is good, and his love will forever endure. We will bless his name as we all proclaim that his love endures forever. Stretched arms and by his might and his love and yours forever. Adonai, Adonai, Baruch Hashem, Adonai, Adonai Melech, Adonai Mala, Adonai Yeshua Tainu.
the Lord has done in your life, I can think easy of a hundred. No time to list them all. But the Shabbat is a wonderful opportunity to meditate on His goodness, His grace, His love, His mercy. He made the moon and the stars at night, and His love endures forever. With outstretched arms and by His night, and His love endures forever. Adonai, Adonai, Baruch Hashem, Adonai, Adonai Melech, Adonai Malach, Adonai Yeshua Tainu. Adonai Melech, Adonai Malach, Adonai Yeshua Tainu. We sing a new song unto the Lord. The prophet Isaiah said, The living, the living, he shall praise thee as I do this day. The father to the children shall make, no, make known your truth. The Lord was ready to save me, therefore we will sing my songs to the stringed instruments all the days of our life in the house of the Lord. Are you ready to praise the Lord for the rest of your days? Because <coughs> that's what we're going to be doing in eternity. <coughs> Pardon me. We're going to be praising and worshiping him. The heavens declare the glory of God. The saints in heaven declare the glory of God. The elders who, who are around the throne casting their crowns at his feet declare the glory of God. Everything that has breath praises the Lord. Are you ready to sing to the Lord a new song?
we sing a new song here at Mishkan David and congregations like it all over the world as Jew and non-Jewish person come together to celebrate the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob no longer as a divided community but as one family coming together. We sing a new song. We are fulfilling prophecy. We are singing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. And as a result of that, we are experiencing tremendous, tremendous changes in our lives, changes for the better. The psalmist said, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth, I will make known thy faithfulness to all generations. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shall you establish in the very heavens. The Lord is faithful. We thought about God. Diminu Elohim, we thought about your mercy in the midst of your temple. Like your name, O God, so is your praise unto the ends of the earth. We thank you, Lord.
Hear the words of the psalmist tonight on this Shabbat. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself in any wise to do evil, for evildoers shall be cut off. But those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Thank you. 
turn to someone now, wish somebody a Shabbat Shalom, and help somebody feel really, really welcome here, okay? And uh, share a word of encouragement, and um, just enjoy, enjoy the Shabbat. Stretched. 
good to praise the Lord. Thank you, honey. Beautiful. Thank you, dancers. Anyone happy to be in the house of the Lord besides me? Thank God it's Friday. Thought I'd never say that. Well, I'm glad uh, there are at least two or three people here. Because that's what the Lord said, where two or three are gathered in his name. He said, he said, there am I in the midst of them. And so praise God. Are we gathered in his name? Yes. Can we say his name in Hebrew? Yeshua. Yeshua. And that's why Paul wrote in his epistle that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be what the name of the Lord means. Yeshua in Hebrew means salvation. Aren't you glad you called upon the name of the Lord? Yes. Is that the best decision you ever made? Yes. Best decision I ever made. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation, and with the heart, a man or a person believes unto righteousness. So we start out with our mouth, but then... The Lord said, you honor me with your lips, your heart is far from me. So it's good to start with your mouth, but it's better to continue with your heart. He looks at a person's heart. And one thing you cannot do is fool God. And he knows where your heart is at all the time. And we'll be talking about that tonight. My favorite subject, Holy Spirit, right? You got something better to talk about? Somebody say, I have the Holy Spirit. So what are you doing everywhere else but? We're in a place called Mishkan David. Mishkan means tabernacle. We're in a place called the Tabernacle of David. Of course, David meaning King David, King of Israel. And King David was a man after God's own heart. And he said something very powerful. He said, in his presence is fullness of joy. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Thank God it only took me 36 years to find out the place of fullness of joy. Uh, and pleasures forevermore. What, what a blessing to find fullness of joy and to continue in fullness of joy. It doesn't stop. And when you are filled with joy, you are a much better person. Yes. People want to be around you yes. as opposed to being angry and moody and, and in a bad mood all the time like you're sucking on lemons. What do they call that, sourpuss? I mean, how many people want to hang out with people like that? And that's why the Lord was so popular because he was always joyful and he was peaceful and he was loving and he was kind and he was merciful and he was filled with grace everyone wanted him over for dinner everyone wanted him over to their house very popular so if people if you're a follower of Yeshua and everybody's running away from you you may want to consider how you're acting you may be acting all religious and self-righteous and Stuff like that. And, and that will turn people off. And, uh, but when you act like him, you'll have so many friends you won't know what to do with. And, and so many people will appreciate you and love you and want to be around you. I mean, it's a good feeling, right? Because I hear people say all the time, I'm lonely. You're lonely because you, the way you act, nobody wants to be around you. You're a killjoy. You're nasty. Who wants to be around nasty people? You know, you're around somebody nasty. When you're done with them, you need, you need to take a shower. You need to take a spiritual shower. You feel, ugh, you know. You're around some people, they make you feel good. And you're around some people, they make you feel, ugh. And so, uh, people don't, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm lonely. I'm by myself. Nobody loves me. Well, because you're not loving. That's how Yeshua made a lot of friends. Because it says we love him because he loved us first. 
You want to have friends? Be friendly. You want to receive love? Give love. You want hassles? Give hassles. And that's the spiritual principle. You will, you will reap what you sow. So whatever you want more of, give it out. And that works with everything, including money. If you're a cheapskate, if you're tight-fisted, it'll come back at you that way. Yeah, you're not. How many people have, have discovered that? Because that's God's way of showing you what you are and how you are. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And most of us learn that the hard way. But anyway, we're in a place called Mishkan David, the Tabernacle of David. And we're going to read a psalm from King David, Psalm 32. I mean, the Holy Spirit loves Psalm 32 and 42. I read those all the time. I mean, it's just beautiful. All the psalms are beautiful. I never get 119. We'll be here all night on that one. How many verses in 119? Psalm 119, how many verses? Over 100? Let's look at that. Psalm 119, that'll be the whole sermon. Right? 119, how many verses in 119? 119, 86. How about 100? Nope. 176 verses in Psalm 119. King David must have gone crazy that day. Yeah, you know, it's like one of those days that all you want is God and all you just want, you just want more of God. And he was just the 176 verse song. That not, that's not a song, that's like a concert. That was concert mode for King David. It's like people were listening, like, when is this song going to stop? Psalm 32 Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputes not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. When I kept silent, my bones waxed all old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity have I not hid. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. For this shall everyone that is godly pray to thee in a time when you may be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come near to him. You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall compass me about with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you shall go. I will guide you with my eye. Be not as the horse or as the mule which have no understanding whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle lest they come near to you. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked but he that trusts in the Lord mercy shall compass him about. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice you righteous and shout for joy all ye that are upright in heart. Amen. Let's continue in prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you. We thank you here tonight. Bless your holy name. We call upon you in the name above every name, the name Yeshua. And Father God, we are not here to seek your hand tonight. We're here to seek your face. That your face would shine upon each and every one of us. Fill us with your precious Holy Spirit. Bathe us, permeate us, our souls, with your Holy Spirit. Let rivers of living waters flow from our bellies. Father, from your throne to your own here tonight, in the name of Yeshua, invade with your light, Father in heaven, every bit of darkness, every bit of oppression, every bit of depression, every sickness, every disease. Father God, invade every one of those things by your presence here tonight, in the name of Yeshua. And Father God, as we rejoice tonight in our salvation, our names written in heaven, Father in heaven, your spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are your sons and we are your daughters. We lift up family members, friends, co-workers, neighbors. We even pray for and bless our enemies here tonight. Father God, 
asking you humbly to draw every one of these individuals to yourself like you have done for each and every one of us. Let them taste and see that you are good. Let their names be written in heaven. In the name of Yeshua. Father God, as we look around this room and there are brothers and sisters who are not here, for whatever reason, Father God, we lift them up to you. Touch them wherever they are. Set the captives free. Deliver, heal, restore in the name of Yeshua. Father, let them come to your house. Let them brag about what you have done in their lives here among the brethren. And Father God, we thank you and praise you that you have given us power over all the power of the enemy to tread on scorpions and serpents. We command every unclean spirit. We break every assignment of the enemy here tonight in the name of Yeshua. Every assignment of the enemy against us individually, against the congregation of the living God in the name of Yeshua. We command every unclean spirit out of this place. And Father God, we thank you and praise you for every single thing that has happened in our lives to this very moment, knowing, as your word says, that all things do work together because we love you and because you have called us for your purpose. Father in heaven, thank you for your purpose for each and every one of us here tonight to conform us into the image of your Son, our Messiah, our King, our Lord, our Savior. In his name we pray tonight. The name Yeshua, HaMashiach, the world knows him as Jesus the Christ. In his name we pray, and the people of God said, Amen, 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 Amen. amen. Now, I've gotten complaints that I speak too much about the Holy Spirit. I have gotten complaints. I'm, I'm serious. Now, when you're in a group of believers, because that's what a, a congregation's about, I mean, I know most of you personally here. I've seen you more than once. I know you're saved. I know you know the Lord. I know you have the Holy Spirit. Amen. So what are we going to talk about? Salvation? No, we're saved already. Now, after you get saved, is it over? Is it finished? Even though he did say it is finished. And I thought I was finished with his finish. Until so the Lord said to me one day, he said, didn't you read that I said I was finished? And he said to me, it's your turn. And I was like, my turn? My turn to do what? Your turn to do what he did. And I was like, not qualified, not able, can't do it, not up to it. I'm like, how can I do what you did? Because I was, if we can be honest, most of us were not taught that we have the same Holy Spirit that was on him. Somehow, it's not, it's not like directly told to us, but it's insinuated that we can never do what he did. That's what, that's what I was taught. We can never be like him. We could never do what he did. We are just not up to par, let's say. Not capable. And it took me a long time to, to get through that kind of wall that's against us, that's been put there by not the Lord, by the adversary. Because it took me a while to realize we have the same Holy Spirit Amen. that he did. Because we love to say Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. How many Holy Spirits are there? So if you have the Holy Spirit, we do not have the watered down version. We have the same. So why aren't we the same as him? And why aren't we doing the same things he did? I mean, I, mean, I love to study my Bible. I love to read my Bible for hours. But that does not replace doing what he did. It's kind of like we learn to hide behind the Bible. It's time to come out from behind the Bible. Because, I mean, you're reading the instructions. I mean, how many times do you need to read the same instructions? Time to do what the instructions say. Amen. I've said this before. I mean, you could read an automobile manual your whole life and never get behind the wheel and drive. You could be an expert on automobiles. 
not even own a car. Never drove. I mean, there's a difference between an instruction manual and there's a difference between operating whatever the instruction manual says. And this is the instruction manual for us, for the Holy Spirit. So what else would you like to talk about? How to get rich in Jesus? And I'm not against, you know, paying your bills. Trust me, it, it, it stinks when you can't pay your bills. And money is powerful. Can't deny that. But money isn't everything. You cannot solve every human problem with cash. You can solve some, but you can't solve everything. So money has a certain amount of power, but God is all powerful. The Holy Spirit is almighty. And so... If we are a group of people that have the Holy Spirit, we need to find out what is it that's preventing us from being like him, walking like him, acting like him, and manifesting what we really do have. And, I mean, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord said what the problem is. And I've read this before. We need to read it again. I need to... I need to repeat these things for myself because we're up against someone who's not anti-religion, someone named anti-Christ. And the word Christ means anointed. It means anointing. He is anti-anointing because we are anointed if you have the Holy Spirit. He is anti-who we are. He doesn't know. He doesn't want us to know who we are. He doesn't know. He doesn't want us to know what we have. And he certainly doesn't want us to know how to operate it, in it or with it or how to walk this way. Because if you don't know, can't do it. You cannot do what you don't know. Amen. You cannot teach what you do not know. I mean, it's, it's sad, all these teachers that don't have a clue about the power of God, how to walk in the power of God, and how to really benefit. Imagine, benefit, John 3. And everyone knows verse 16, right? For God, I remember seeing this in football games at the end zone when they kick a field goal that somebody would hold up the sign, John 3, 16. When I wasn't a believer, like, what is John 3, 16? Until I read it, for God so loved. God loves. But do you think most people experience the love of God? No, most people experience the wrath of God. And most people are mad at God. And it's like, it's like telling somebody, you're going to hell. Why should you tell somebody who's going to hell that they're already in hell? It's an insult. It's, it's better to say, and I've said this before, you're better off saying to a person, would you like to experience the love of God? Because most human beings have not experienced the love of God. Because, because the love of God is expressed by a person, his son, that he sent into the world. It was expressed this way. Because it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only one person to the entire world. Think about this. For everyone to experience the love of God. So if you reject Jesus, will you experience the love of God? Absolutely not. You'll experience the wrath of God. You'll experience the negatives. I mean, no, God has a negative side. Do you have a negative side? Most people experience the, the negative side of God. And most people have never experienced the, the, the love of God, the positive side of God, the blessings of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God. Because most of us live against God. Even people that say believe in God. I mean, you can believe in someone and not know him or do anything that he said. Yea or nay? It's like the Lord told the religious people of his day, in Matthew 15, he says, you honor me with your lips, your heart is far from me. 
You're a hypocrite, he called them. You're hypocrites. And you teach for doctrine the commandments of men. In other words, you've replaced God's commandments with man's commandments. How many know when you do that, that's trouble with a capital T? You won't experience the love of God because it says this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And it says his commandments are not grievous, are not grief. When you do what God says, it's not grief, it's joy, it's blessing. It changes your life. The devil's mad already. He's calling and trying to interrupt. For God so loved the world, verse 16, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever, whosoever believes in him should not perish. So if you don't believe in him, you're perishing. Amen. Yeah, you're nay. You're going to hell. No, you're, go, you, you're there. You're there. You're just going to go from bad to worse. Because when you're not perishing, you're just going to go from good to better to best, or glory to glory. And that's how the walk should be. Should not perish, but have. Not temporary life, but everlasting life. And you don't have to die to experience that. That's another thing. People say, well, I'll experience everlasting life when you die. You will experience everlasting life when you die. It may not be good because you may end up on the wrong side of the equation. And like the Holy Spirit reminded me many years ago because I said, how does this work? He said, very simple. You're walking. And how you're walking, when you come out of your body, you just keep going in the same direction. Very simple. You're going in God's direction, you get more of God. You're walking away from God, you get less of God. In other words, you'll go from, from, to light, if you're walking in light, to more light, or you'll walk in darkness and you'll end up in more darkness. As, as a matter of fact, I remember a, a brother in the Lord or a friend that I had who had walked away from God and um, he said that he had a dream. And the Lord in a dream showed him, he said, I had left my body and he said it was so, it was so dark it was pitch black. He said, I was still alive in this dream, but I couldn't see my hand in front of my face. I mean, that's a scary dream. God was telling him, you're going in the wrong direction. Because the Lord said, straight and narrow is the way that leads to life, and only a few that find it. It's not that God doesn't want many. He just most don't. Choose not to. In other words, it's always been a choice. It's always been free will. God doesn't take away your free will. You can do whatever you want to every day. You can love God today and you hate him tomorrow. I've seen that. You can be in God today and walk away tomorrow. I've seen that also. How many people have seen that? Scary, right? Sometimes I wish I didn't have free will. Sometimes I wish I was a robot. But if we were robots, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be love. It would be robotics. <laughs> I love you, God. Can you imagine being married to somebody like that? I love you. Get out of my face. That wouldn't be very real. Mechanical. Free will is true love. We choose to love. We choose to hate. We choose to forgive. We choose not to forgive. We make choices. God gives us choices. And by the choices we made is where we end up. By your own choice. In other words, you can't blame anybody else. You made the choice. Verse 17, John 3, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. In other words, God, our Father in heaven, had to send somebody in this world because this world, most people are condemned. 
if we can be real. Even the ones that don't think they're condemned, a lot of them are condemned, because they don't practice. They practice something weird. How do you know it's weird? Because you're nothing like Jesus. If you're nothing like Jesus, it's weird. I don't care if you're Jewish or you're not Jewish. For God so loved the world that he gave his Jewish people, non-Jewish people, Chinese people, (laughs) Japanese. Doesn't matter. One person to save the entire planet that is condemned. Basically, most people are condemned. And then he explains why we're condemned already. Again, verse 17, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He that believes on Him is not condemned. What is condemnation? It's death. Death. It's life and death. I mean, is this serious business? This is serious business. It's not life and in-between death. It's life or death. It's light or dark. You're in or you're out. It is or it isn't. That's the kind of God that we serve. He's a serious God. He that believes on him, verse 18, is not condemned, but he that believes not is condemned already. I don't believe in God. Done. Put a fork in you. You're condemned. You're dead. Where are you going with other dead people? Some people say it's eternal damnation. It's eternal torture. It's eternal pain. Some other people say, well, it's soul sleep. You better hope it's soul sleep. (laughs) But imagine being alive for eternity separated from God. Well, you seem to like it. You've done it all your life here. What's the difference? You did it for 70, 80, 90, 100 years. I hate God. Well, keep going. Have another few thousand years of separation from God. You seem to enjoy it your whole life. You seem to, that's what you were used to. Yeah or nay? I mean, I meet people that are that got one foot on a banana peel and one foot out the door, and they're still against God. I'm like, Are you crazy, loco, or nuts? I mean, don't you know when you leave this body, you're hitting eternity? You better hope there's no God. You better hope there's no hell. And still, like, so cavalier about it. I I remember as a child going to synagogue, and I remember only old people were there. I'm like, how come only old people are here? Because they know. What do they know? They're going to die. <laughs> Young people are like, ha, 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 Enjoy your youth. It's like, how come only the old people show up in a synagogue? Only old people show up at the synagogue. We're still having fun here. They're ready to die. They're trying, they're getting their, their house in order. You know, like people say, you better get your house, you get affairs in order. So in other words, God is, is, is at the end of your life. It's an afterthought, just in case. You know, I know I'm going to go to the great by and by, and I might as well maybe, you know, not take any chances. I might as well show up there in the synagogue or in the church. Because, I mean, most places are like that. I mean, when you see young people in a congregation worshiping God, you, I'm impressed. I'm like, whoa, you mean you realize you're going to die? You mean you're getting an early start? I mean, I, I, honestly, I, 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 I respect, I rejoice in young people that have realized that and they're worshiping God at a young age. Bless your heart. Most people only wake up to it like, you know, right before they have their stroke or heart attack or whatever, you know. They're hoping, it's like I told a friend of mine, because he said, no, I'll do that prayer. I'll, I'll, I'll accept the Lord in my life right before I die. I said, what happens if you just drop dead? You ain't got no time. <laughs> so he did the sinner's prayer right there. I said, you know, you might as well do it now. 
case you drop dead right now. Tomorrow is promised to no one. No, he said, I'll do it right before I die. I mean, what happens if you like bang your one heartbeat away? In other words, in, in most people's lives, God is an afterthought. God is a, a in case of, maybe. I mean, we're just silly creatures. Verse 18 again, he that believes on him is not condemned, but he that believes not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Just believing in the name. Because that's how it starts. How, does, how do you come out of condemnation? How do you get saved? You've got to call upon the name of the Lord. That's what Paul wrote. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord. Why, why is the name of the Lord so important? Because the name of the Lord in Hebrew, Yeshua, means salvation. you got to start out with salvation. you got to get saved. But then after you're saved, you just got started. Now that you're saved, now that we got a group of people that are saved, because come on, how many people that are not saved show up? Let's get real. Why do you show up? Because you're saved. Because you want to hang out with other saved people. Amen. I mean, how many unsaved come here every week? They come in once, they look around, they're like, I'm out of here. <laughs> they're not for me. It's not for you. Because there's a bunch of saved people here and you're not saved. So you're sticking out like a sore thumb. I don't feel right here. Of course you don't feel right because you ain't saved. Now that we're saved, now what? What are we going to talk about? Salvation? No, we're saved already. Talk about boring. No, let's talk about who we are and what we are and what, what we have now. Where are we going? Where, what is this? Verse 19, and this is the problem. This is the condemnation. Verse 19, this is the condemnation. Jesus is explaining to us, this is the problem. This is the condemnation. What's the condemnation? Why are people dead? Why do people need to get saved? Why do, need, why do people need to call upon the name of the Lord? Because this is the condemnation. This is why they're dead. That light has come into the world. Notice what he says. The only begotten is light coming into the world. If light is coming into the world, what does that mean? That the world is in darkness. Are you with me? Because that's the problem. Everyone or most human beings are in darkness and they don't even know it. You know when you know you come out of darkness? When the lights turn on. I mean, if you were born in a dark room, in darkness, and you lived in darkness your whole life, and you never saw light, how would you know the difference? What would seem normal to you? Darkness. It's like I grew up with black and white TV. When color came around, like, whoa, <laughs> color TV. Now, if, I, if, if there was only black and white TV, TV would always have been black and white. I remember when that RCA showed up in our, in our house, man. That console, like 30 people had to carry it. It was so heavy, you know. <laughs> now you pick up like a 50-inch TV with one hand. Is that amazing? And it's in high definition. In those days, you had to like play with the antenna, put like aluminum foil on the ends. No, stand right there, hold it. There, right there, don't move it. Because everything was fuzzy on the screen, remember? Now it's like you can see the pimples on a person's face. Look, she's got blackheads. You can see the sweat marks. You can see the grease on their forehead. Ew. High definition. So if, you, if, if your whole life were in darkness, would you know the difference? That's the problem. People do not know the difference. Because when you tell somebody you need to get saved, they're like, saved from what? I mean, I'm okay. What's your problem? I'm breathing. 
I got a job. I got a paycheck. I got a roof over my head. What do you mean saved? So this is the condemnation, verse 19, that light has come into the world. And notice what the Lord said. And men loved what? What do we love? Nah, come on, Lord. Are you, are you telling us we're this dumb? That we love what? He didn't say like. He said love. It's like, come on, Lord. We love darkness? Didn't he say that? Nice Jesus. Said what do we love? Darkness. What are we used to? Darkness. What's normal to us? Darkness. What feels right? Darkness. What feels weird? Light. What stands out? Light. Light has come into the world and men love darkness. Men love darkness so much that look what they did to the light. Oh, they respected him. God is here. Our Savior is here. They're like, who is this guy? Who do you think you are? Who gave you this authority? What school did you go to? You know, what's your qualifications? I'm the creator. What's your qualification? None. What's your degree? Darkness. What's your PhD in? What's your doctorate? Oh, I'm a do I have a doctorate in darkness. Oh, and you seem to be hanging around with a bunch of doctors in darkness. And that seems quite normal. And then somebody shows up in light and goes, hey. And they're like, loco. Crazy. Who's this crazy person? Look around. What are we surrounded by? Darkness. What's normal? Darkness. I'm with a group of lovers of darkness. All my friends are in the dark. We're cool. <laughs> my friends are in the darkness. I'm in the darkness. What are you talking about? Men love darkness rather than light, verse 19, because their deeds. What are you saying, Lord? Their deeds. What are deeds? Things you do. What do you do? Things that get you in darkness. In other words, repentance is what it's about. Lord, I'm sorry. What are you sorry for? My dark deeds, the deeds that caused me to live in darkness. What did I repent from? Because I loved darkness before. How, how, many, how many people have admitted to God that you loved darkness before? You No, most people don't. You didn't say, I love darkness. You just said, I'm sorry, Lord. You didn't even know why you were sorry. Someone told you, ask the Lord to forgive you. Okay, let me ask the Lord to forgive me. Lord, please forgive me. Most people don't even know why. Most people don't even know what they're asking. Because if you knew what you were asking forgiveness for, you wouldn't continue doing it. Are you with me? In other words, if you really asked the Lord to forgive you of something and you knew what it was, then you wouldn't continue in that something like that. In other words, when you ask somebody to forgive you of some deed you did, are you going to keep doing it? Because you know what happens when you do that? You have to keep asking for forgiveness over and over. I mean, that's why people got to get saved every week. Every day. Because you're still doing the same things. You love darkness. You are used to darkness. Your friends are in darkness. Someone comes in with light. He's totally different than everyone else. Everybody's looking at him in a different way and thinking, this is not right. Why isn't he right? Because everybody else is wrong. And wrong is right and right is wrong. Doesn't it say that? That, that 
evil would call good evil. Doesn't it say just like that? Because look, everyone's the same. This is normal. Lord, you're abnormal. Well, I need to be abnormal because I want you to pull you out of your normality because your normal is killing you. And you're, you're, you're dead already. And your friends are dead. And your family's dead. And your children are dead. And everybody around you is dead. And dead is normal. And I'm here to raise the dead. I'm here to raise you up to sit in heavenly places even though you were dead. I want to give you that opportunity. Let me raise you up to sit in heavenly places even though you were dead because you asked me to forgive you of your deadness, but you didn't even know why you were dead because if you knew why you were dead, you wouldn't keep doing the dead things. Your deeds would change because that's the definition of insanity is to do the same things over and over and expect different results. In other words, you need to have your deeds, uh, what's the word? He calls them reproved. You need correction, which most people can't handle. Leave me alone. If he leaves you alone, you're dead still. Because we said this last week, what is the difference between someone who's saved and someone who's not saved, if you do the same thing, there's no difference. You're just as dead as the next person. In other words, in other words, you're you you're you're more in trouble because you shouldn't be dead, because you're doing the same thing that dead people are doing. Because you refuse to be reproved, you refuse to change. You refuse to admit that what you're doing is killing you and ruining your life. And your life ruined is proof that you're doing the wrong thing. Because how many know God does love? God's love is to see you suffer and do horrible in your life. That's his pleasure. That's our God. No. Our God wants to change you and I so that we don't have to suffer the same consequences of somebody who's already dead. But in order to do that, you have to allow God to change you or reprove you. In other words, the Word of God is for that. Why do I read the Word of God? Because I want to know what's right and I want to know what's wrong. Because I don't want to keep doing the same things that caused me the misery that caused in my life. And I'm willing to change and I'm willing to admit when I'm wrong. I'm willing to admit that God is right and I am wrong. Is there something wrong with that? I mean, how many know God is always right? God's never wrong. Even when you think God is wrong, he's right. How many people have thought, oh God, this is wrong, you blew it. And then afterwards, you had to say, God, you were right. I blew it. Come on now. That happened to me many times. Every time I thought God did something wrong, I was like, everything it does is right. All things work together for the good. Amen. In other words, how does he work all this stuff together? He's a genius. He's amazing. Because you'll take bad things and turn them into good things. I mean, it's, it's amazing how God, because people think this is just all happening by chance, things that are happening in your life. When you're a child of God, it says all things work together for the good for those who love God. In other words, everything that is happening in your life is for a purpose to change you. To change you from darkness to light. To change your behavior. God is into behavior modification, like Esther likes to say. Esther loves to say that. He's in the behavior modification business. Because if your behavior doesn't change, your life doesn't change. Because men love darkness. So you need to change the behavior that caused you to live in darkness. Does that make sense? Light is coming to the world. Men love 
Darkness because their deeds were evil. Because notice what God calls evil. Not a thief, not a liar. Somebody who's in darkness is evil. Does that make sense? In other words, he doesn't want his sons and daughters to be in darkness. Because who is in darkness? Those that are separate from him. If we're going to be reconciled to him or we're going to be saved, then we must behave differently. In other words, in John 17, he says, I sanctify myself that you may be sanctified. I separate myself. Watch what I do because I'm not like everyone else. I'm different because my behavior is light. Your behavior is darkness. I'm going to sanctify myself that you may be sanctified through the truth, that you may observe someone who is, doesn't love darkness hates darkness, light is coming to the world, look at this behavior, copy this behavior. Yay or nay? In other words, don't argue with light. Argue with other darkness. But don't argue with light. Don't argue with somebody who's in light all the time. And, and come on now, you've argued with God. As I said, even when you thought you were right, you were wrong. I was wrong. So this is the condemnation, that light is coming to the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil, verse 19. Notice what he says in verse 20. For everyone that does evil hates the light. I mean, imagine. Everyone that does certain things hates light because they're doing the, the opposite of light. They're doing things that keep them in darkness. Yay or nay? Their behavior keeps them in darkness. Uh, question, what's so good about darkness? Is anything good in darkness? Can anything grow in darkness? And let me tell you something. Most of us have never experienced real darkness. Because we're in cities and there's lights and there's this. We don't, and there's stars and there's moon. Imagine with everything gone, not even a candle. And you're sitting in this. No light from the stars, no light from the moon. Lights out. That's what people love. That's what the Lord said. Men love darkness because my this friend that i had god gave him a dream because he was going in the wrong way when he died he came out of his body he said i couldn't see my hand in front of my face it scared the the, the, the you know what out of him scared the hell out of him <laughs> literally because god was showing him that's where you're going to end up because people think, oh, I love dark. No, 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 no. You're out there. You see stars. You see the moon. You ain't in dark. You haven't seen darkness. And I wish that on nobody. Because who created the heavens and the earth? He even put little sprinkle, you know, twinkle, twinkle little star. That when it's dark, it ain't dark. You got stars. You got the moon. Like how many people say, ooh, what a beautiful moon. Because it breaks up the darkness. Children are afraid of darkness. We put night lights for the kids. I remember my daughters, I had to put a night light in the room. Because they were afraid of the dark. Yay or nay. And, and the Lord says, that's what you love. Are, are we that crazy? For everyone that does evil hates the light, neither comes to the light, lest his deeds should be what? Reproved. In other words, when you come to God and you get saved, he will reprove you. In other words, he will correct your behavior or try to correct your behavior, because that's the problem there. The Holy Spirit's reminding me, there's your free will. In other words, you don't have to be corrected. You have to want to be corrected. Amen. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness. Amen. That want to do the right thing. 
For they, the Lord said in Matthew 5, shall be filled. As you got to want it. Me wanting it doesn't do anything for you. It does a lot for me because I want it. I don't want any kind of darkness in my life. Sorry, I'm afraid of the dark. I was afraid when I was little. I don't like the dark. Do you like the dark? Imagine being conscious in pitch darkness. I mean, is that the scariest thought? That's what the Lord gave this person this dream. Yeah, I'd be crying too. <laughs> Notice what he says in verse 21. But he that does truth comes to the light that his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in God. In other words, we come to the light because we say, God, I want you to teach me and I want you to reprove me and I want you to change every area of my life that leads me to darkness. What was the last time you prayed that? That's what you need to pray. I don't want darkness anymore. I want my life filled with the light of God. I can't see you, God, but I know you are. And I can, and I can, and I can sense you. How many people can sense the presence of God? If you could see what you're sensing, it would be pure light. Because the presence of God is pure light. The Bible says there's no darkness in him. In other words, God is giving us an opportunity through his son and through the way, the truth, and the life to be in light all the time. And then we resist. Somebody say, time to resist the prince of darkness and submit to light, to, to the God of light. And that's what's so good about Scripture instruction. Why do you read the instructions? Because you want to be a Bible scholar? No, I want these words to teach me to no longer live in darkness. I'm not reading the Bible to be a theologian. I'm reading the Bible to get the hell out of hell. It's like this preacher I heard once, what in hell do you want? That's why, I, I don't know why you read the Bible. You want to be a Greek expert, a Hebrew expert, a Latin expert, an Aramaic expert? No, I want to be a light expert. Amen. Second Timothy. In other words, I got I to change your, 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 your uh, reading habits because some of you are just reading, just, I don't know what's wrong with you. You just want to be this scholar sitting in darkness I want you to read the Bible to get out of darkness. Because doesn't it say the word is a lamp unto my feet? I mean, the word of God is supposed to be a lamp for you to walk towards light and get away from darkness, completely away from darkness. Are you with me? 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in what? In theology? So you could be a biblical snob? I met some biblical snobs. What's the big deal about that? I want to be in light. I, I want to be instructed out of my darkness. Because I admit, I love darkness. I didn't even know God. I wasn't even saved. My deeds were evil. The things I did... My behavior. So what's scripture good for? First of all, it's given by inspiration of God. In other words, even though people wrote the Bible, 
And people say that. I, I, people wrote the Bible. They were inspired by God to write what they wrote. In other words, it's a divine book. It's a divine book. It's a holy book for his people. And it's not discerned by men. It is spiritually discerned because it is spiritually given. Amen. Are you with me? Yes. In other words, if you don't connect to God as you read the Bible, you won't understand it. If you rely on people to teach you the Bible, you won't understand it. It's Holy Spirit given and Holy Spirit discerned. In other words, if you have the Holy Spirit and the Bible is inspired by God, you have the author of the Bible living inside of you. What are you doing asking everybody else what it means? Ask the Holy Spirit, what does this mean? Because he wrote it. But we're so used to relying on people that we don't do that. I learned to ask the Lord. You don't see me calling you, asking you, what does this mean and what does that mean? Because, I mean, I love you, but I don't care what, what you think. I really don't. I don't I'm, I'm not calling you for your opinion. I want you to tell me what the Holy Spirit says. Maybe I'm having trouble hearing from the author of the Bible that day. But I'm not interested in what you think. Because what you think is usually wrong. What you believe to be true is usually false. What you call light is dark and dark is light. You got it backwards. And the Lord warned us at the very beginning, don't touch the tree of knowledge of good and evil because that day you will die because you will, you will call good evil and evil good. Isn't that most of humanity today? Come on now. They think we're evil. What are you doing on a Friday night? Wasting your time, stupid though. Because if people thought this was right, they would be banging the door down. Amen. They think we're nuts. Because they're calling good evil and evil good. Just like the Lord said, you touch that, you're going to die. And those that call good evil and evil good are dead. And most people, that's the way they look at things. Dark is good and light is bad. Yea or nay? So all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness that the man of God, in other words, notice what it says. Who is scripture for? For the unsaved? For those that don't care about God? Or scripture is a personal book Written by God, by the finger of God, just like the Ten Commandments. In other words, if he can write on stone, he can write on paper. Amen. This is a private book for people that know God and are going in the right direction and are allowing the book to change them, not us to change the book. Amen. 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 I used to argue with the book. Where did that get me? More darkness. When did the book start to change you? When it started reproving me. When it started correcting me. When I admitted I needed correction. And it changed my behavior. What changed? Darkness to light. I, don't, I, I hate darkness now. And I love light. And I want to be in light all the time. Because most believers, and the Lord told me this many years ago, most believers are in darkness and occasionally step into light. And the Lord said, that's not how I want my people to be. I want my people to be in light and occasionally step into darkness. Come on now. You trip, okay, you trip. But you trip from light to dark, not from dark once in a while you step into light. Because then you go right back to darkness. That's what this feels normal. that the man of God may be perfect, verse 17, thoroughly furnished unto what kind of works? Your religious works? No, his works, what he did, what he manifested, what he demonstrated. 
You need to demonstrate in your life what he demonstrated in his life or you're not doing it correctly. Yea or nay? If we have the Holy Spirit and we have the instruction manual. As a matter of fact, we're so blessed to have the entire uh, um, instruction manual for our own reading. Because in biblical times, like for example, only the king of Israel had a Bible written. Now we have the Bible for us to consume for ourselves and with the Holy Spirit, the writer of the Bible living inside of us. I mean, you want it better than that? Amen. And they're like, I don't know what God wants from me. <laughs> Jesus? What does God want from me? Jesus. What does he want me to act, act like? Yeshua. What am I supposed to be like? Yeshua. Just keep saying, Yeshua, 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 Yeshua. Keep calling on the name of the Lord and go his way, his truth, and his life. And it will manifest that you're going in the right direction. Is it really 20 to 10 already? I don't believe it. This stinks. See what happens when you talk about life? It's not a burden. What's a burden? Darkness is a burden. Condemnation is a burden. Doing the things that keep us dead. That's, a, that's like that heaviness. That spirit of heaviness. It's the anointing that destroys the yoke. That destroys the bondage. It is being in light that destroys all the works of darkness. And I mean that's what it says in, in, in 1 John 3. Because, I mean, again, and the Holy Spirit's reminding me, stop reading the Bible to be a theologian. Start reading the Bible to get out of darkness. Are you getting this? Yes, amen. I mean, another Bible scholar sitting in darkness, we don't need. It, it's, like, it's like Paul said, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. No power, no anointing, no manifestation of the Holy Spirit. You're just a theologian. You're just a bookworm. And, the, and, and Paul said the opposite. We're to be ministers of the Spirit and not the letter because the Spirit gives life. It's the letter that kills. And I'm not against Bible study. I'm just saying the way you study your Bible, you got to watch yourself. Uh, we're reading it not to become some kind of Bible scholar. We're reading it to be corrected and reproved and changed so that we don't live in darkness anymore. And what a blessing to live this way. And you will stick out and you will stand out just like he did. And you will be, we said this last Friday, you will be maligned, you will be evil spoken of because men love what? So when you're in light, what are they going to say about you? You're weird. There's something wrong with you. No, there's something right with you. There was something right with him. The world sits in darkness because their deeds were evil. I think we should read First John again, chapter 3 from the beginning. I think we read that last week, right? I think we need to read it again. In verse 1, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knows us not. See, and the Holy Spirit's reminding me again, the minute you start going for light, the world will not know you because the world loves darkness. Don't expect recognition from the world when you walk in this way. Just like he was not recognized. Does that make sense? In other words, you will be maligned. You will be criticized. All kinds of stuff is going to be said about you just like it was about him. Because what's normal to them is darkness and condemnation. And, and, and it breaks my heart to even say that. 
that there's so many people that are dying and they don't even know they're dying because they have so much company. Think about it. We don't have a lot of company. We're outnumbered. Completely outnumbered. It's the truth. Therefore the world knows us not because it knew him not. Beloved, verse 2, now are we the sons of God and it does not yet appear what we shall be. What we, but we know that when he shall appear we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself purifies himself in other words why do you have to purify yourself because if you don't do it no one else will your free will will prevent you from purification what are you being purified darkness to light that's my that's what i want to be purified of i don't want any darkness in my life anymore as a matter of fact i don't even like to hang out with people that are in darkness i can only take them for a little while because they're like, ugh. Because they're dead and they don't even know they're dead. I mean, that's how crazy. I'm hanging out with people that are dead, 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 dead. Don't have a clue about God. Don't have a clue they're in darkness. Don't even know they're condemned. That's how crazy it is. Don't even know they're condemned. And it, it bothers me because it's like, I was there. I was that ignorant myself. And ignorance will kill you. My people perish for lack of knowledge. God's people even. Verse 4, whoever commits sin transgresses also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. That's why the devil is after the law so much. Because you're asking God to forgive you of your sin and then you're told by people not to keep the laws of God. The laws of God will get you out of darkness. The devil knows that. That's why he's anti-nomunist, anti-nomunism. Anti-law, anti-commandments of God. That's what's prevalent today. And the people that are anti-law argue with the, with the people that are keeping the commandments of God. But we're not keeping the commandments of God for some kind of religious behavior. We're keeping the commandments of God because the commandments of God teach you how to walk in light. If, if, if properly discerned and put in order. But like the Holy Spirit's reminding me again, everybody studies the Bible what everybody else is saying instead of studying the Bible with the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit will give you proper discernment on how to properly divide the Word of God. Proper division or proper doctrine will either lead you to light or keep you in darkness. And how many know the devil is, a, is an expert at twisting the Word of God to keep you in darkness? I mean, it's It's scary. And you know that he was manifested, verse 5, to take away our sins, our deeds that kept us in darkness. He was manifested not only to forgive us of our sins, but to take away the behavior. Are you with me? To take away that behavior, to change your behavior. Behavior modification, like Esther likes to say. He's into behavior modification. And the more you resist behavior modification, the longer you will stay in darkness. And you know that he was manifested again, verse 5, to take away our sins. And in him is no sin. In other words, what is the word of God telling you? In him there's no darkness. In him there's no darkness. Whoever abides in him, verse 6, sins not. Whoever sins has not seen him, neither knows him. I mean, if you preach sin, we're always going to be sinners. The spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. If you talk this way, you don't know him because he was sinless. Whom the Son of God sets free is free indeed. He will set you free from what? 
from the sin that got you in darkness and got you condemned. Come on now. He's a good God. He's an awesome God. I mean, I love God not, because he, not only because he saved me. He corrected me and taught me how to get out of darkness in my life. And I enjoy the light of God and the presence of God now over everything. There's some nice shiny stuff and nice toys here. But those can never give you light or, or a spiritual life. I like light. My soul thirsts for, for, for light and the presence of God. And that's, I mean, where are you in heaven? What is there? Is there it, it, there's, is nighttime there? Is there darkness in heaven? Where are we going? We are going to a place that there's only light there. And, and everything is light. There's no darkness whatsoever. Zero darkness. We're going to a place that the word darkness won't even, we'll, we'll forget about it. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. And, and the light is God. His perfect light. And, and everyone who's had a near-death experience, when they get into the presence of God, they say that light is pure love. It's an amazing feeling when you're in the light of God. And we have that opportunity here on earth before we even get there. That's, ama that's, what amazing, that's what's so amazing. Little children, let no man deceive you, verse 7. He that does righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. In other words, if you're going to do things right, you have to do it his way. Not self-righteousness, not this one's righteousness, not this one's road, his road. His straight and narrow that leads to life. That only a few find, he said. He that commits sin, verse 8, is of the devil. For the devil sinned for the, from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy not tolerate, not accept, not be defeated, but destroy the works of the devil, that he might destroy the works of the devil. This is why Yeshua was manifested, to destroy the one who is the prince of darkness, who brought us all into darkness. How did he bring you into darkness? He spoke to you. His words led you to darkness and God's words lead you to light. That's why Paul said when Yeshua appeared to him on his way to Damascus and he saw the light and uh, the brightness above the sun, that he said that when the Lord spoke to him in Hebrew, he told him what he wanted. Yeshua told Paul what he wanted from him. I mean, how many know what Paul was a tremendous evangelist and a tremendous man of God? And Yeshua told him exactly when he's giving his testimony in Acts 26 and verse 13, we're going to close because it's like past my bedtime. And some of you, I guess too much light, you get bored, right? We need some suntan lotion tonight. No? More, more, more light. See, this is a cool group. You guys like light. You're serious for God. I, by the way, this place says you got to be serious for God. If you're, like, if you're like lukewarm, this place ain't for you. This is for people that are serious. If you're playing games, Mishkan ain't for you. If you enjoy darkness, plenty of places out there that will teach you. That will help you in your darkness. Now notice what Paul says in verse 13 here in Acts 26. At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun, if there's such a thing, shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And we were all fallen to the earth, verse 14. I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in Hebrew, in the Hebrew tongue. You mean God speaks Hebrew? Cool, man. He spoke in Hebrew, and he told him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the pricks. And I said, who are you? He knew who it was. He was, like, he was stalling. Like, 
He was nervous. Who are you, Lord? And he said, I'm Yeshua, I'm Jesus, whom you persecute. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose. So when he appeared to him, what did he see? Light above the brightness of the... I don't know if you guys caught that. And what happened when Paul saw light above the brightness of the sun? His eyes were... His eyes were fried. That's how... That, that's light. That's God. That's Jesus. That's Yeshua. Yea or nay. That's where we're headed. That kind of light. But you won't have these eyeballs that aren't prepared for that. You'll get a new set. You'll get spiritual eyeballs that you'll be able to look at that light and it won't hurt you. Are you with me? Awesome, right? That's what we're after. But rise and stand upon your feet, verse 16, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness both of these things which you have seen and of those things in which I will appear to you, delivering you from the people and the Gentiles unto whom now I send you to open their eyes, to make theologians out of them, to teach them religion, What did Jesus tell Paul? What does he want? Do you notice that? What did Yeshua say to Paul? He said, I want you to turn. Well, how come we didn't even go to the next verse? How come we're not in 18? You don't like light either? <laughs> to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light. To light. That's Jesus talking. I like that whistling. You got a cheering section. Imagine saying this in a room full of dark people that love darkness. They're like, boo. Here it's like, yay. To turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sin and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. I mean, you want it better than that? It don't get better than that. And we're just going to go from glory to glory. And one day you won't have to believe that he is. Because unless you want your eyeballs fried, people say, God, I want you to appear to me. Don't say that. Not in these bodies. Careful what you're asking for. You can't handle it. You better get a thick pair of sunglasses if you want God to appear to you. Because you will be blinded by that light. That's who he is. That's who our God is. And that's what he wants us to be taken from darkness to light. His, his words, the word is a lamp unto my feet and a guide for my path. That's the word. That's the word of God. Are you with me? I mean, I, I love reading the word of God. I love studying the word of God. But be careful how you read it and why you're reading it and where you're going with it. Where does he want to take us? From darkness to light. He wants to take us out of that darkness. Somebody say amen. amen. Somebody stand up and honor him, please. Amazing. What an amazing God that we serve. So is it a bad thing to be corrected by God? Where's he taking me? From glory to glory. More light, less darkness. Somebody say, more light, less darkness. Say, Lord, I want more light in my life. Your light. Let your face shine upon this person. 
Hallelujah. The book of Isaiah says, Arise and shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon us. Somebody say light. And those that sit in darkness may see a great light. Yea or nay? What did the Lord say? You're the light of the world. You're the salt and light of the world. Just like the Holy Spirit said to me, your turn, your turn to shine. Your, your turn to, to manifest the light that's in you through the person of the Holy Spirit. But you can't do it if you keep doing the same things that kept you in darkness. Are you with me? Somebody say amen. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you. We thank you. Bless your holy name. Father, take us. Thank you for taking us, each and every one of us. Not only forgiving our sins, but turning us from darkness to light, that we can shine bright for you, Lord, that those that sit in darkness, just like when they saw the great light on you, Lord, may see your light in, emanating from each and every one of us and let them be attracted to that light so that they can come out of darkness also, that they may receive forgiveness of sin and be turned also from darkness to light. Father God, we pray for every person that loves darkness, that you would change hearts, that you would change minds. And even in us, Lord, that we would hate darkness, that we would hate the adversary and all of his deeds, and that we would love you, Lord, and love light, and submit to you, Lord, and resist the devil, that he may flee. And we pray this in the name above every name, the name Yeshua, HaMashiach, the world knows him as Jesus the Christ. In his name we pray and the people of God said, Amen, Amen, Shabbat Shalom. Thank you for being here. Thank you for watching on the internet. We're going to close in. Worship. Worship. And the bedtime shmo. We delight in your law, Lord. We submit ourselves to you and offer ourselves up as a living sacrifice. Teach us your ways, O oh Lord. Reprove us, change us. Refine us like gold. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Saying great, great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are your ways, Lord, O King of the saints, who shall not fear? Lord of Lords, may we ever seek your light, Lord. Praise God. And as we dismiss the service for tonight, I just want to encourage all of you to come tomorrow morning as Shabbat continues and just enjoy the light. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. And if the Lord is the desires of your heart, that oh my goodness, you have everything you need. Um, and uh, I just want to encourage you to um, 
stay break bread with one another. I want to thank all of the people who support this ministry with tithes and love offerings, with their volunteers. Uh, many people are not aware that online that, that this ministry is entirely supported through volunteer, volunteer efforts, volunteer contributions, all of it. And it's, it's really miraculous. It's an amazing thing to, to be present and to see a, a, a ministry flourishing just through simply through volunteer work, people hearing the, the voice of God and being obedient to his leading. That's really wonderful. And uh, wow, it really ministers to me. Um, I, we're going to close the service with the bedtime Shema. We want to make sure that our hearts are always in the right place. We want to make sure that, that when our prayers, that we submit our prayers, that they rise like, like sweet incense to the throne of grace. Not that the heavens are like brass when our hearts are filled with darkness. I can bet you that your prayers are not going to be heard because it, it comes from the wrong place. So let's say the bedtime Shema together to make sure that our hearts are always in the right place, okay? Sovereign of the universe, before I sleep, I forgive all who have angered me, upset, or sinned against my honor, body, work, or all that's mine. Whether willful, careless, accidental, purposeful, or through their speech, by word or by deed, in this world or other worlds, let no one be punished for my wrong. May it be your will I not sin again towards you, that I may not do wrong in your sight. May any wrongs I've done be erased in your great mercy, not through any punishment or pain. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart, be acceptable before you, my Redeemer and my Rock. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad, Baruch Shem Kevod Malchuto Leolam Ba'ed. Blessed be his name, whose glorious kingdom is forever and ever and ever. Amen. All right. Shabbat shalom, everybody. We will see you in the morning. Laila Tov.